Hey guys! Welcome back to the channel. I hope that you all guys are well and doing absolutely fine. If you are new on the channel and like to listen true scary stories, then make sure to hit the like and subscribe button down below. So grab your earphones and let's just start with today's stories. I spent a little time homeless, but I was luckier than most because I lived in my car. Having a job, a place to shower, and somewhere to sleep, even if that somewhere was the back seat of a beat-up sedan, set me apart from others on the street. Still, it wasn't an easy life. Saving for a place while trying to scrape by wasn't exactly the most hopeful situation. The hardest part was always finding a safe place to park and sleep through the night. This was in the late 1990s, in the northern suburbs of Chicago, around Waukegan. Most places had strict parking rules. Whether it was a business lot or apartment complex, you needed permits to stay there overnight. And since I wasn't a resident of any building, I was always at risk of being noticed and told to move. I learned early on to never stay in the same spot twice. I'd spend my evenings driving from one end of town to the other, scouting new places where I could lay low for a night. Motel parking lots were decent options for a while, but I had to be careful. The trick was to leave early in the morning before anyone noticed a car parked too long. It was winter, and this night was the worst so far. A storm had been brewing all day, wind howling as snow steadily piled up. It didn't bother me at first. If anything, I thought the snow would cover my car, hiding me from view, giving me some much-needed peace. I was tired. More than tired. Exhausted. But I hadn't considered that the snow would make parking impossible. Every lot I tried was either full or impossible to navigate through. Time stretched on, and frustration and exhaustion mounted. I drove for hours before I finally gave up and found a spot on a quiet side street in town. It wasn't ideal. I didn't like parking near residential streets, but I was too tired to care. I parked and crawled into the back seat, buried myself under layers of blankets and hoped for a quiet night. I'd barely closed my eyes when I heard it. The sharp, jarring sound of knuckles rapping hard against the glass. My heart jumped. My first thought was the police. They'd caught me. I'd be told to move along or worse, get arrested for loitering. But when I peeked out from under the blankets, what I saw was much worse than a cop. There, just outside my window, was a man. He looked homeless too, but it wasn't his disheveled appearance that scared me. It was the look in his eyes, the way his face twisted with desperation his breath fogging the glass as he pressed his face close to the window. Let me in, he yelled, his voice muffled by the glass but unmistakably urgent. It's freezing out here. I felt a pang of sympathy. I knew what it was like to be cold, to be out there, exposed. But I didn't know him. And that fear of the unknown, what he might do if I let him in, kept me frozen in place. I shook my head, mouthed no, hoping he'd understand. His face twisted further, anger flashing in his eyes. He banged harder on the window, his voice rising. Let me in, or I'll get in myself. The sound of his fist pounding against the glass grew louder, more frantic. I could see the wild determination in his eyes. He meant it. Adrenaline surged through me. I knew he was going to break the window. The glass vibrated with each hit, the cracking sounds growing more ominous. I had no choice. I scrambled out from under the blankets and leapt into the front seat, fumbling to start the engine. My hands shook as I turned the key, praying the car would start in the freezing cold. The moment the engine roared to life, I heard it the unmistakable sound of glass shattering. The man had broken the back window. He was halfway through when I slammed my foot on the gas, 
tires spinning on the icy pavement as I lurched forward. He didn't follow. The car fishtailed as I sped away, my heart pounding in my chest, the cold air rushing in through the broken window. I didn't stop driving until I made it back to the parking lot of the restaurant where I worked. I never slept there, afraid my boss or co-workers might figure out I was living out of my car, but that night I didn't care. I was too shaken to go anywhere else. I parked as far from the entrance as I could, slumped down in the front seat, and let the panic and exhaustion wash over me. The cold was unbearable. The shattered window let in gusts of freezing air, and despite my blankets, the temperature dropped below anything I could handle. Sleep was impossible. I sat there, shivering, staring into the dark, trying to make sense of what had just happened. By the time morning came, I was still in shock. My back window was cracked, but the glass hadn't completely fallen apart. It held, miraculously though the car was now filled with snowflakes that had blown inside during the night. I knew I had to get it fixed, but that was a problem for another day. For now, I was just grateful to have survived the night. I'm 24F and moved into my first apartment by myself. I usually have roommates, but my last situation was sexually harassed by two guys in my house, and also by a 60-year-old woman who was a severe alcoholic and drug addict. Long story. I've been here for two months, and it's been good. I love the place, the apartment, the location. But yesterday I got the shiot scared out of me when I received a knock on my door at 3 a.m. I live on the top floor of a 25-floor building and was the first to move in after renovations, so there is only four to five people on my whole floor. I had no texts, not calls from anyone I knew about coming over. First they knocked. I was silent. They knocked again. It sounded like a man knocking. I called my mom, telling her this situation and that I was utterly terrified being a young woman. They waited a few minutes and knocked again. My mom called the police for me and two women officers came up. I told them what happened and they were super kind about the situation. The only person who I could have maybe expected to knock, the only person who had access, the doorman. This doorman in particular has always had a very strange vibe. He never talked much, but he was always watching me. I'd go to the elevators and he'd get out of his chair to stare at me waiting for them to open. He is a 28 to 32 year old, I'm not sure exactly how old, and pretty tall African American man. He'd always check me out, and while he wouldn't say much, he'd flirt. Two days ago, I was going out with some girlfriends, and I was dressed in a tight and short black dress with black boots. He seemed really interested in me at that point, and definitely spent extra time staring at me. I don't really think much of it, so after talking to the police, I went downstairs and asked him, Hey, so I got a knock on my door at three in the morning. Was that you by chance? And he immediately said, Yeah, it was. I was like, uh, why were you knocking on my door at 3 a.m.? And he's like, well, it was T3 a.m., it was like 2.30, and then, I was just checking up on you. I said, why? And he mumbled something under his breath. I'm like, what did you say? He said, I don't know. I gave him leeway, I said, because you thought I wasn't okay. And he's like, uh, yeah. And I said, why wouldn't you think I was okay? Again, he said, I don't know. I told him that it really scared me. I also said, I see you three to four times a day. Why couldn't you just talk to me down here? I don't know. Looking back, I also received a knock on my door at 12.30 a.m., but it was very faint, enough where I thought he was knocking on someone else's door. So weird. After I told him to not knock on my door again, he called me and left a voicemail on my phone. I noticed the random number and realized he'd called me at midnight 
and at 3 a.m. I'm super scared because I live alone. Ring doorbells aren't allowed in the building unless requested, and also the management company keeps hiring guys like this. The last guy was fired. I'd ideally like to actually end my lease, even if he gets fired, which he definitely will considering the last guy who wasn't nearly as bad got fired. That would be good, but he now knows where I live, what car I drive, when I come and go, and also has access to the magnets to get up the elevator. He even asked me a few days ago, what's your unit number? So we could come up. Like it was premeditated. I'm super scared and hear stories about this all the time. I'm terrified he'll have a maintenance key or something, come into my apartment and hide and wait for me to get home. A young girl was killed by someone who worked in her building. What do you think I should do? I used to be a doorman at a club back in the 80s. By then, I'd long outgrown my fit-to-be-tied days and had gone clean. No more booze, no drugs, not even cigarettes. I hadn't touched any of that stuff since the late 70s, and I'd made peace with the idea that I didn't need to. Every year, the family that owned the clubs threw a kind of underground shindig. It was a chance for all the bartenders bouncers and dancers from their four clubs, two in Tucson and two in Phoenix, to come together and let loose. The parties weren't exactly sanctioned events, but they happened. This one was in Tucson, a sprawling affair with a fully stocked bar, blaring music, food, a pool, and more cocaine than anyone could ever reasonably snort in one night. There were dancers, patrons, regulars, and people with darker ties, mobsters, cops, and undercover agents who liked to hover near the scene. Families even showed up mixing in with the crowd like this was just another day in the life. I watched from the sidelines, keeping to myself, trying to enjoy the music, when I spotted a guy stumbling his way across the dance floor. He wasn't just drunk, he was absolutely gone. Each step looked like he was fighting gravity, like the air was heavier for him than anyone else in the room. He stopped near a sliding glass door as if he knew it was there. Then, with all the confidence of someone completely disconnected from reality, he tried to walk right through it. The loud thud of his body hitting the glass echoed over the music, and before I knew it, he was on his back, scrambling around like a bug on the floor. People were trying to avoid stepping on him while he was slinging what was left of his drink across the room and cursing like a sailor. It was a mess, but not the kind of mess that was my responsibility. This wasn't my place, not my job. Still, I kept an eye on him. Something about him didn't sit right. As the night wore on, the mood stayed high. The music was a mix of poison and glam rock that blurred into the laughter and chatter of the crowd. Everything seemed to be rolling along smoothly. Then I spotted him again. This time, he wasn't flailing around on the floor. He was seated on one of the plush couches in the main room, where the dancers were strutting their stuff on a makeshift stage. One minute, he's nodding off, slouched on the couch, and the next... He's in a shouting match with someone I couldn't see. Then, suddenly, he stood up, staggering. And as he did, a nickel-plated Smith & Wesson .38 special slipped from his jacket, hit the couch, and slid onto the thick carpeted floor like a snake. I felt the room close in. I stood, and without saying a word, gestured to the other doormen and dancers around me, their eyes followed mine to the gun, and while they watched, I took out my handkerchief, strode across the room, and picked up the pistol like it was part of some sleight-of-hand trick. I lifted the middle couch cushion, slid the gun underneath and dropped the cushion back in place. Just like that. I returned to my spot near the stage, 
locking eyes with a few of my fellow doormen as they nodded, each of us quietly acknowledging the situation. For a few brief moments, everything felt calm again. But it didn't last. Minutes later, there was shouting, loud and frantic. I turned to see the same guy now on his feet, red-faced and raging. Where's my fucking gun? Somebody stole my fucking gun. I got up again. This time I approached one of the other doormen from a different club, pulled him aside, and explained the situation. I told him where I'd hidden the gun and suggested that he and a few others make sure the guy got out of there before things spiraled any further out of control. We all agreed. Once he was outside, hand him back his gun and send him on his way with an escort. We didn't need that kind of trouble inside. They left at around 2 a.m. without further incident. The rest of the night was the usual. Drunks trying to maul dancers, a couple of slaps across the face, but nothing worth noting. I went home, figuring that was the end of it. The next morning when I got to work, my boss Tom, the general manager for all four clubs, waved me into his office. I could tell from his face something was off. You know that incident at the party last night? He asked, voice tight. I tried to play dumb. What party? He didn't buy it for a second. Don't be coy with me. You know exactly what I'm talking about. He leaned in closer, voice low. You know the guy you took the gun from? I felt a chill creep down my spine. I hadn't even thought about it after the night ended. Yeah, what about it? Tom's face darkened. Just answer the question. What is this? An interrogation? I shot back, half-joking, trying to shake the tension. Tom didn't flinch. I just thought you'd like to know, he said, voice quieter now. The guy you took the gun from was the biggest cocaine dealer in Tucson. I felt the floor drop out beneath me. The weight of it all hit me like a sucker punch to the gut. I stayed silent. After you guys gave him back his gun, Tom continued, he and his designated driver had a falling out over on Sendario Road, kicked the guy out of the car and drove off. Next thing you know, he's in a head-on collision with three girls in a pickup, killed all four. I couldn't say anything. I didn't have the words. Tom stood there, letting the gravity of what he'd just told me sink in. Take the rest of the day off, he said, with pay. I left his office, but the weight of that conversation didn't leave me for a long time. Thank you so much, guys, for listening to these true scary experiences of people. I hope you enjoy the stories. If you guys have any real-life scary experiences, share your stories on our Gmail account. Have a nice day guys, enjoy the stories. And also let me know down in the comments below if you guys want any specific type of scary stories.